I'm Marilyn Priyal. Welcome to The Better Part. Neuropsychiatrist Dr. Saad Shacker is here to help us understand more about depression and anxiety mood disorders. Stay with us. Dr. Shacker is trained in medicine, neurology, and psychiatry. He finished medical school in Baghdad, Iraq with highest distinction, being the top graduate in his class, as well as earning the highest graduation average in the history of the medical school. He also did medical training in London University in England, subsequently doing a rotating internship in obstetrics and gynecology, surgery, internal medicine, cardiology, and behavioral medicine. He's just returned from a medical humanitarian mission helping refugees in Jordan. Dr. Shacker, it's so nice to have you back with us again. It's a pleasure to be with you here. I was looking forward to seeing you again and talking to your group. Tell us about depression. Depression is a huge area and an area of interest of mine, and it has changed significantly in the past two, three decades based on more knowledge about uh, the brain and behavior, psychology. So one way to look at depression, it's more like a syndrome that can affect biological, psychological, behavioral, environmental factors and it's diagnosed by doctors, primary care, psychiatry, psychologists, and the diagnosis includes um, seven, uh, nine criteria. Uh, one major criteria has to be either depressed mood or diminished interest, and four of, five, uh, four of the remaining uh, criteria will include sleep disturbances, appetite disturbances, fatigue, negative cognitive changes in one's thinking, uh, suicidality, difficulty with concentration, and sometimes other symptoms of uh, lethargy and lack of motivation in doing things. And in order to meet the criteria, you have to make sure it's not due to another medical condition or another psychiatric condition like schizophrenia or bipolar or substance abuse. And it has to be present for at least a two-week period. So that's what the American Psychiatric Association um, includes as an overview of diagnosing depression. So most people could have, uh, the average person could have a particular sorrow or uh, regret that they carry with them even for a lifetime, but they live normally. So that would just be something that we would talk to our analyst about or a friend or somebody. It's not a clinical medical issue. Absolutely correct. I think it's really important not to overdiagnose and not to underdiagnose. I always say that grief is a normal life process. Um, stress after you break up a relationship. We only diagnose depression when it meets the criteria I mentioned and it is having impact on occupational functioning, family relationships, mm -hmm. and causing some degree of disability. Uh, grief is a normal human process. So when you look at diagnosis of depression, there are different subtypes. Major depression is one of the ones that we see. Uh, the statistics show about 18% of the population in the U.S. in their lifetime would, would, will meet criteria for major depression. And oftentimes it's recurrent. It can come and go. Uh, there is a type of depression called dysthymia, which is a low-grade chronic depression. Uh, there are what's called adjustment disorders, let's say with depressed mood, where someone has a break of a relationship and they're depressed but not meeting the full criteria. Uh, bipolar depression is an important one to know because that's a segment of a bipolar illness and it could be a disabling uh, segment of their illness and we might see it as regular depression. But if we don't know the history and if we don't know the diagnosis, we might treat inappropriately with antidepressant, which can cause more complications. But perhaps we can talk about that at a later point with you. All right. 
So then would this be called unipolar Correct. depression? Yes, yeah. unipolar depression is used to describe major depressive disorder. I see. So um, will people maybe have this for many, many years and go undiagnosed, or does it reach a point where they, they're desperate and need help? How, how does one know well, that they actually have this? Well, clearly, I think everything you said is correct. Sometimes people have it for years, and it's not diagnosed. And we usually see people during a, a period of crisis. But when we do our own assessment, we look at prior history. Most people who have unipolar depression, major depression, have some beginnings in early puberty, um, young to middle adolescence. They might have not been diagnosed, but if you look carefully, there might be some evidence of beginning symptoms. And then we look at their life uh, history, how many times they've had episodes of depression. Because sometimes with or without treatment, the depression can be short-lived or could last six to nine months. The goal of treatment is to speed up recovery. They enter into uh, a doctor's office, usually when they are more severely depressed, but it's important to assess the whole uh, individual and their life history when we evaluate them. Sometimes people don't know they have depression. In other words, because if you break a leg, you can see a broken leg. Sometimes people don't know, don't know they have depression. And when they come in and we discuss it, they say, oh yeah, I've been depressed for a long time and, uh, and has fluctuated in severity. There are some individuals who have what we call double depression where they have like a low-grade chronic depression, but periodically gets more severe, and that's when they have more disability from it. So, like, if somebody stays in bed for days, you know, and just can't get up and just can't go to work or can't make life work, would that be like a double depression? Or? Not necessarily. That could mm. be a unipolar depression. So I think it's really important to take a longitudinal history. When someone is that depressed to stay in bed, they definitely meet one segment of the criteria. Then it's in the clinician's responsibility to find out whether this is a long-term issue, a more recent issue. Oftentimes we do measurement-based medicine now, where we do rating scales on depression. For example, I often ask, we have uh, regular rating scales we use in the office, like uh, PHQ-9, Hamilton Depression, Montgomery Asberg, but I also have the patient do their own. Zero will be no depression, 10 would be suicidal depression. So sometimes we track where they're at on that spectrum, how long do they stay there, what, are there any triggers that lead to it or not. So each person is different from the next, so it's very important to have an individualized approach, but a general knowledge of the field. But make each assessment individually, because people do vary. So do sometimes people think, well, what's wrong with me? I got to get up and, and tough it out, and maybe their family is just irritated with them because, you know, what's matter with you? Get on with your life. So do people just go on like that sometimes without ever knowing? We, uh, when I lecture on this subject, I often say depression can affect uh, the individual, their loved ones, and their society. So it's very important educating. Family members is crucial because a lot of times you turn people's thinking from blaming the patient for something to providing support that they have a disease very much like if you are a diabetic with a blood sugar of 400, you can't be blamed for you know, what you do. I think it's important to mobilize support. So education is important, family involvement, and, um, and community support. We encourage people to talk to their friends. There are uh, organized uh, support groups through National Alliance for Mental Illness and other sources that are very helpful to involve the patients in. Now, uh, is depression always where they're melancholy and sad? I've, you know, like curled up in a little clump in bed. Or are there other uh, manifestations of their behavior? Behavior so the describe the melancholy is a concept we don't use much now, okay. but it re reflects severe paralyzing depression. Mm -hmm. There are many types of depression, and keep in mind when you talk to an expert on depression, there's also people who don't, what we call smiling depression, because they might have a clinical syndrome of depression, but they cover it with a facade. 
Um, I started a new patient yesterday who's bubbly, cheerleader type, but privately when the door is closed, I know she's extremely depressed. So very important to recognize that sometimes people don't manifest feeling depressed, which is why the criteria change to include diminished interest. Especially in elder, elderly people, you say, are you depressed? No, I'm not depressed. Do you still enjoy your golf game? No, I don't. It's boring. I, you know, my wife pushes me. I go golfing, but I don't really enjoy it. So diminished interest is another manifestation. As a physician, I know many patients with depression go to their primary care doctor with physical complaints, repeated uh, aches, pains, fatigue, sleep disturbances. So sometimes we call it masked depression where they're coming in with more uh, somatic physical symptoms. Uh, sometimes there are medical illnesses that go hand in hand with depression. For example, fibromyalgia is a pain syndrome in the body, but uh, statistically many individuals also have had depression, not everyone. So it's important to really individualize the assessment to include medical, biological, psychological, environmental, neurochemical. So we do really a, a broad angle of a new patient to see which system is disrupted and what can we do to fix it. There's also now evolving evidence of genetic susceptibility, both for depression, but also what a whole new field called pharmacogenomics, where we can now study how people process medications. We can't assume people are made the same way because we each have our own genetic predispositions and that affects how we metabolize medications. So it's the era of personalized medicine and we're on the cutting edge of really, so anybody who's seeing this show who has depression and they're just, it's definitely not one size fits all and definitely not here's a pill for you, you're gonna be cured. You have to look at the environment, you have to look at psychology, behavioral habits, uh, medical issues, addiction issues, all of these have to be evaluated. People with depression do have a lot of physical pain though a lot of times, don't they? Lots of migraines and, and, uh, and maybe aggravated uh, intestines and so forth. Is that part of depression? Yeah, so let me say depression is no longer head up. That was old thinking. Depression is, uh, involves neurochemical changes and electromagnetic changes in the nervous system. And the nervous system is not just in the head. You mentioned the gut, bladder, back, pain. So a lot of these uh, organs have receptors that are nerves. If you go microscopically inside the receptors, there are chemical uh, messengers, neurotransmitters, that can be imbalanced, similar to the central nervous system. So when it's in the central nervous system, we have clinical depression, clinical anxiety. When it's in the peripheral nervous system, or what's called the enteric nervous system, which is in the gut. People have irritable bowel syndrome, people have pain issues, people have bladder issues. So very important, our colleagues in medicine, to know that because a lot of times those patients end up needing, unne uh, getting unnecessary medication, unnecessary surgical procedures, and we all know the epidemic of uh, opiate overuse and prescription drug overuse because it's based on something is missing in the assessment and you're giving a Band-Aid rather than fixing the condition. Do um, sometimes people with depression, are they can be irritable or agitated? Absolutely, I mean irritability and agitation is often a frequent traveler with depression. As a matter of fact, one of the criteria that I might have not mentioned diagnostically is either psychomotor agitation, which is more physical, restlessness, difficulty to relax, mm -hmm difficulty to sleep, maybe even pacing around. Sometimes you describe the person staying in bed, sometimes it's psychomotor retardation. So you can have someone who's a slug who can't really do anything. We've seen people who, their doctor think they're catatonic, like a schizophrenic, but they're actually severely depressed, they can't move. And you see people who are ready to, you know, pound uh, the walls and, you know, break things because of severe agitation. So yes, absolutely, you can have the extreme. Well, let me also mention the eating issues can be extreme. Traditionally, depression is diminished appetite. But now we actually see what's called, what used to be called atypical depression, where people eat too much. 
uh, and you know binge eat and and I'm not saying every binge eater has depression mm -hmm. but you have to look at the whole person and assess what's going on and those could be manifestations is that because food makes them feel better or is it as a, a actual something in their system that makes them eat more I think just by the nature of the question you're kind of looking at yes or no answer I don't I think it's really better to have a global way of looking at it if I someone who has binge eating I wouldn't make a diagnosis until I really study the whole person at times it's comfort eating we also have in our practice a medical weight loss program and we evaluate the patients to see whether the eating is coming from I, one of the slides I show is cognitive area of the brain, which is like comfort food. Each one of us has memories as associated with the food. So sometimes when you're sad, you might want a piece of cake or chocolate cake or something. That's something you have control over. The emotional eating comes from an area of the brain which uh, handles emotionality and mood. That's really a lot of people with depression and anxiety do a lot of comfort eating. And then survival eating is when somebody starves themselves and goes a long period without eating. They start craving maybe their own kinds of foods and might, they might have protein deficiency, etc. What about sleep? Sleep Some also. Stay, it seems like they stay awake all night. And yeah, others, so the, yeah. the classical picture for an agitated depression is you have excessive worry, your mind can, cannot settle down at night, you're uh, an overdrive essentially and you can't sleep or if you do fall asleep you have interrupted sleep you wake up frequently you don't feel refreshed but there's also sleeping too much so there what used to be called atypical depression you know like uh, during seasonal depression people feel like a slug I call it the bear hibernation syndrome where they don't feel like moving they eat too much they have craving for carbohydrates and they sleep maybe 16 hours a day so both extremes, but the common type in agitated depression is diminished sleep and poor quality sleep. Does that make them more argumentative, just the way that they feel? Do they tend to be argumentative? Well, you're, you're setting all the right questions for my future episodes when <laughs> okay, I talk about right. sleep disorder. Okay. Absolutely correct. It's because sleep lack of sleep that makes them... Sleep deprivation okay. adds complications. Mm -hmm. So in other words, sometimes when I worked in the emergency room, I'd see somebody in an emergency room who's not been sleeping for several days, they come in with psychotic symptoms. Mm -hmm. They're not schizophrenic. When you treat the sleep deprivation, they actually get back to normal. On the other hand, if you are bipolar and you deprive yourself of sleep, even if you're on a business trip to Japan, that can trigger a manic episode. So I think quali quality and quantity of sleep are an important component of wellness and if there's any disturbance in that we evaluate whether it's a symptom of a disease or if it's a cause of concern or a combination of both. And how does anxiety, is that then part of the bipolar too? I mean, I'm sorry, the unipolar. So anxiety is a standalone uh, diagnostic statistical oh. manual diagnosis but there is 90% overlap with mood issues. As a neuroscientist, as uh, we, we look at ourselves, the area of the brain that controls anxiety is in close proximity to the mood center of the brain. So oftentimes you see frequent symptoms that include both anxiety and depression. On the other hand, there are some anxiety conditions that do not work with depression. For example, phobias. Social anxiety sometimes is a standalone. Generalized anxiety often overlaps with depression, but because anxiety is more persistent and depression is episodic, sometimes people say, oh, I have anxiety, I have depression, not realizing that they might be manifesting different phases depending on when you see them. Some anxiety disorders are very paralyzing, like if someone develops obsessive compulsive disorder, where that by itself becomes a, a disability, where they have to um, dwell on obsessions or compulsions that paralyze them from functioning normally. So that's a more severe case. Um, and they might, uh, might or might not have depression. So we have to evaluate the overlap between the two. And then um, what's panic disorder? Panic, panic, a real full-blown panic attack. Panic attack is regarded one of the anxiety disorders and is a sudden and severe onset of symptoms 
usually either triggered or untriggered, but they include very dramatic and scary symptoms. An individual who's had panic attack will have anything from racing hearts, heart, pain in the body, hyperventilation, sweaty palms, really catastrophic thinking during the panic attack. People think, oh gee, I'm, I have a brain tumor, I'm gonna die, it's a heart attack. So it's very scary and they're frightened and they end up oftentimes in an emergency room. So very important to recognize if you have a panic disorder, there's a button that's gotten pushed. We need to evaluate whether that panic attack was induced by a one-time event or whether it's the beginning of a panic disorder. Panic attack can be triggered, for example, by sleep deprivation. Too much caffeine can trigger severe anxiety or even sometimes panic attack. But if it's a reoccurring condition, then it could be panic disorder and people can start developing phobic avoidance. An example of someone gets in a sudden, I saw a patient who had a car accident, very unexpected, he was driving and then somebody hit him on the side unexpectedly. He became fearful of driving afterwards because they start associating fears with when the panic occurred, crossing bridges, public presentations. So um, that answers that. Panic, panic disorder is a very severe form of anxiety. Okay, it is a form of anxiety, but, not, but anxiety and panic attack are not on the fringe of depression. They're not part of depression disorder. Well, they are associated with depression, chronic anxiety and chronic panic, very often there is also a depressive component or major depression overlapping. Uh, but when they present, you might be going to an emergency room doctor for a panic attack, but if you don't really screen, so my advice is when you have anxiety, screen for depression, when you have depression, screen for anxiety, because they can be overlapping, rarely separate entities. About 10% standalone anxiety has nothing historically with depression but a lot of times mm -hmm. they overlap in a sequence of a one's lifetime maybe not the minute you're seeing them but three years ago they might have depression now they're having a panic attack very right. very uh -huh. much so if you have a random panic attack and it does not reoccur that's mm -hmm. called a panic attack but mm -hmm. if you have repeated recurrent panic attacks then it's called a panic disorder okay. and then you, by the classification you have two subtypes with, with, with uh, avoidance behavior or without avoidance behavior. Generally, when someone has recurrent panic and it's not been treated, they start developing avoidance behavior also, like fear of driving on free, freeways or public presentations or other fears they might have exaggerated based on the fact that they had panic in those situations. I know that the medicines uh, that are given for these different things can be uh, the patients don't always want to take their medicine for, I guess, physical reasons. Is that why a lot of uh, people with these conditions kind of stop taking their medicine sometimes? Well, let me backtrack a little bit because your question implies we always use medication. Sometimes we don't really. Okay. Sometimes we treat them with behavioral therapy, cognitive behavioral therapy, uh, lifestyle modifications, for example, I'm a great advocate for exercise, mindfulness, meditation. Nowadays, uh, you have apps on the phone that are calm, relaxing, headspace, different ones that help you manage stress effectively. And uh, you can do yoga, you can do meditation, you can exercise every day. Those are helpful things, but if the symptoms of anxiety or depression are not controlled adequately by lifestyle modification, then sometimes uh, specialized talk therapies what we call evidence-based cognitive behavioral therapy, or DBT, CBT, those are provided by a trained professional. Now, all that said, in severe cases, we do use medications. The medication, if you use them for anxiety, you know, usually we try to control the anxiety with a tranquilizer, but my advice is to do the minimum of that because these are the same medications that if you use them on a long-term basis, they could be habit-forming. However, if someone has recurrent anxiety and depression, we sometimes use serotonin or serotonin norepinephrine medications that are classified under the antidepressants, but many of them do help modulate or modify anxiety symptoms. We also now are really excited about two new developments in our field. One is I touched on by called pharmacogenomics, where 
people are not made the same. So if someone has been on multiple meds, we can do gen DNA sample and look at how their body is processing it. And we discover no wonder they did poorly with that medication because they are w not metabolizing it normally. We also have medical interventions that do not involve medications. We have a new treatment that involves magnetic stimulation of the brain called transcranial magnetic stimulation. We also have other um, you know, exercises where we can control pain without using pain medications, like TENS unit or modification like that. So the field is really vast and developing. The take home message is if you're not happy with your care, get a second opinion and get to know exactly what's going on because in my own opinion, once you know what's going on, we have a lot of tools to treat it. So nobody should accept uh, a suboptimal outcome. What about seasonal disorders? Is that part of depression? So now we know there's many factors. So there are some predictable, what I didn't say earlier is when we evaluate someone with a mood disorder, we look at genetics, we look at environmental issues, we look at childhood development, we look at current environmental stressors, and we look at general medical issues and sensitivities. For example, in women, hormones play a very important role with, with mood disorder, whether it's PMS, whether it's postpartum depression, whether it's perimenopause, menopause, because the area of the brain that regulates mood is very hormonally sensitive. We also now see in men sometimes with low testosterone that can affect mood when they go through what's called andropause. Season is a very interesting new development. Years ago, we used to think people get depressed because they can't do much when it's dark in the winter. We no longer see it that simplistically. Now we know there's an area of the brain called the pineal gland, and one particular area called the suprachiasmatic nucleus in the pineal gland that's very sensitive to light. And when you have shorter daylight, uh, in the winter, sp particularly in the northern uh, uh, hemisphere, Alaska, Scandinavia, well, you have much shorter daylight time. That area is, gets uh, imbalanced and it can cause severe mood issues. We see seasonal affective disorder, we see higher rates of suicide, we see more depression, we see more withdrawal, dim diminished functionality. So yeah, absolutely, we now even have a therapy that involves using lights if somebody has seasonal depression, um, if they can't be on a beach in, in Hawaii or Miami, sometimes we use therapeutic lamps during the dark days to help with that. Let me also say, which we're not talking about bipolar, but when we do talk about bipolar, light can act in the other direction. Spring and summer can induce a manic episode sometimes if you have a susceptibility because you have too much light so and euphoric, you, have too much, huh? you get, get euphoric. This has been wonderful. Thank you for coming. Pleasure to be here.